and weigh the mountains and scales, and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him? Taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him in knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding. To whom then will he liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Has thou not known, and has thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, who created the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk. And not be faded. Lord, I pray give us strength, Lord, and we're weak, God. Even we're too weak, God, to praise you, God. Give us strength. Give us faith, God, just like we were studying Sunday school, God. Give us faith, God, when trials surround us, God. We we'll pray, God, for us to lean on you, God. We need your joy, we need your peace, God, to help us walk this way.
two hands. He can't be anything other than faithful. And when we fear or doubt and we waver, he still abides faithful. And our trust can be rooted so deeply in him. We can be steadfast and we can be unmovable, not because of the way we feel, but because of what he said, because of who he is. And God, we thank you for that promise today. One among so many, Lord. How can we thank you today, God? Lord, we just cry out to you. Can you just thank him this morning for his great faithfulness to you? For those that don't know the Lord today, let them see us rejoice. Let them see us in the thankfulness and praise in our God for his abiding goodness to us. Thank you. 
Watch over them. 
Lord. Bless their time. Keep them safe, God. And let your light shine through them greatly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you, if you would, to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to read a good portion of this uh, throughout the message today of this chapter. We're going to start with the first eight verses in a very familiar story. You know, last year, I think I lose track of time, but uh, we did a study on the life of Elijah. One of my favorites. If you can have favorites in the Bible, one of my favorites. And this is how uh, his earthly life ends. But our message today is not so much about Elijah as it is his successor, Elisha, who was with him at this time. Very familiar story, but a wonderful, exciting story. You couldn't make up fables and tall tales and myths as good as what we're getting ready to read, okay? Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, Elisha, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal, and Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophet that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou? that the Lord will take, thy, take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elisha said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by the Jordan. By Jordan. And Elijah took his men and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, and they too went over on dry ground. We're going to stop right there. We're going to read more of this in a little bit. We know the story, if you're familiar with your Bible. And again, we had a wonderful study in, on the life of Elijah. This is how he departed from this earth. Nobody's ever gone like Elijah went. Chariot of fire is about to swoop him up and, and take him up to heaven. And here's Elisha. Elisha is the servant of Elijah. Elisha is not the one that's known. Elisha is not the one that's known for being the prophet of the Lord. I said he wasn't a godly man. Obviously he was. He was not known nor had he walked, had he walked in the fullness of that position which he was about to walk in. So he is the servant. Okay, just a servant. We're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were servants of the Most High God. And so he's just a servant. I say just, but you understand how I mean that. Just a servant of Elijah. Elijah was that prophet at this time. He had been. He was the man of God. He's the one that stood in the presence of Almighty God. And this, this scene is repeated. This, this evidently is happened, happening in one day. Okay, that they are starting out in Gilgal, and Elijah says, I've got to go down to Bethel. The Lord sent me to Bethel. And Elisha says, Well, I'm going with you. He says, Well, tarry here, because God sent me, because no, as, as the Lord lives, as my soul lives, um, I'm not going to depart from you. So he was content to let him go. When they get down to Bethel, there are the sons of the prophets. And we've studied this in our Elijah study. There was actually, I believe it was, it was obviously during this time, that there was the school of the prophets and the sons of the prophets where they were, they were godly men. They were uh, seeking to, uh, to grow in the things of God. They were called the sons of the prophets. And so it was almost like a school where they were being taught, okay, the things of God. And when he gets to Bethel, here the sons of the prophets came, and they kind of just get over there and kind of pull Elisha to the side. And they said, don't, don't you know the Lord's going to take your master away from your head today? What does that mean, away from your head? The 
picture that I've studied in that culture in that day would have been the, the master, and in this sense that would have been Elijah, and the servant that would be Elisha, and the master is sitting or standing, and the, the servant is at his feet. The servant's at his feet. So lowly position, and yet in God's eyes, there can be a great, a great thing, especially if we're servants of the Lord. Don't you know that the Lord is going to take your master from your head today? He says, I know it. Hold you your peace. Literally what he's saying is, I know it. Be silent. That's what that means. Be silent. Be quiet. And so the, Elijah's in, in Bethel and he says, the Lord's called me to go to Jericho, Elijah. You stay here. He repeats the same thing. As the Lord liveth, as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And so they two went on to Jericho. In Jericho, there are fifty of the sons of the prophets that are in Jericho. And they come and pull him aside and they see Elisha. Noah's down the month that the Lord's going to take the master away from your head today. His response was the same. Yea, I know it. Be silent. Hold you your peace. And and they too went on and they go on to uh, to Jordan. And that's where the river is parted. Elijah uh, hits his mantle, his, his outer garment upon the water. And the Jordan's parts and they cross. And that's where we left off. And here's here's the thought that the Lord has given us for today. I know this, he says, hold your peace. Don't you know the Lord's going to take your master away? He's going to be taken away from you today. And, and I'm almost reading that, but it could be a little taunt, you know, like a little dig, like a little taunt. I don't know that. It's just there's, evidently this was something that was known, that God had made known to Elijah, Elisha, and even these prophets knew it, that this was going to be the day. They probably didn't know the details. This was the day that Elijah was going to be taken up. They knew it. They were aware of this. And I almost see a little bit of a dig or a taunt that, don't you know the Lord's going to take your master away from your head today? It's almost like a, it's almost like it's a little criticism or like a, a dig or an insult, like almost the thought that I get is, then what are you going to do, Elisha? What are you going to do then? Don't you know he's about to be taken away? Elisha has his eyes on the Lord, though. Elisha has his eyes on the Lord. He says, I know that. I know it. Keep silent. Just keep silent. Okay? Keep silent. He has his eyes upon the Lord. Elisha is the man of our message today. He has his eyes on the promise. His own future, Elisha's own future, his high calling of Jehovah is tied up in this man, Elijah. They're connected. And not only is his high calling and his hope and his future in the Lord tied up with Elijah, it's tied up in this event, this day that's about to happen. He had been a faithful servant for some time, years probably, to Elijah. But it's tied up. He knows what's about to happen. And what everything is coming to him from the Lord and the calling of God upon his life is tied up in this man Elijah and tied up in this man, this moment, this event that's about to take this place today. Number one, he's not going to be separated from it. You know, I'm not going to get tired and just stick behind and let you go do your thing. It was, a, it was a test. This was a test for the man Elijah to hang in there like a bulldog and, and stay with Elijah until he was taken up. But these things, uh, the sons of the prophets knew this. But Elisha is basically what I'm gathering is saying, Yea, I know it. Hold you your peace. When he says this, Elisha knew everything that the sons of the prophets knew. That he was going to be taken, Elijah was going to be taken that day. And Elisha knew more. Elisha knew what they didn't know. Elisha was not going to be moved. Whether, however, whatever we read into that statement by the prophets, know ye not that your pastor is going to be taken from your head today. One thing I gather from this, Elisha was not going to be moved. Whatever they said to him, whatever Elijah said to him, was not going to, going to deter him from seeing this through all the way. He had a knowing from God, and he was going to stay in there, and he was going to stay there. <coughs> He was not going to be deterred. He wasn't going to be discouraged. He wasn't going to be uh, depressed. He wasn't going to be, oh, your master's going to be taken from me. He wasn't going to be distracted. 
Elijah wasn't going to be afraid. He wasn't going to be confused. He wasn't going to be troubled, especially so close to the fulfillment of what was God had called him to. He'd been in the shadows, very much so, in the shadows of Elijah. I love Elijah. I said he's one of my favorites. He'd been in the shadows. He was just that guy you would see hanging around with Elijah, serving him, fixing him meals, you know, things like getting, fetching water, whatever he would do. He's done, that's what he appeared to be to all the, the rest of the world. But he was not going to be distracted so close to the receiving the blessing that was coming to him from God. I know everything you're saying, Elijah <clears throat> says, hold you your peace or be silent. And I believe there's really something significant here about this man at this time. Again, he was only a servant. He was at the feet of his master. But Elisha knew what God had been preparing him for. He knew what was about to take place. And so he knew what Almighty God was working in him. And he wasn't going, and where everything wasn't coming to an end. I almost feel like the, the, some of the prophets thought it's all going to end for you today. What are you going to do then? Your prophets, your, your master's going to be taken. Elisha knew this wasn't the end. This was the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. This moment was going to be the fulfillment of what was coming his way mm -hmm. from the Lord. The other prophets knew that Elijah would be taken from God, but they didn't know what Elisha knew. They didn't know what Elijah knew from the Lord and believed from the Lord. <clears throat> And they didn't know what else was going to take place that day. They just knew Elisha was going to be taken. They didn't know the rest of the story. There was the rest of the story. Elisha knew it. He knew if he could hang in there and believe and trust the Lord, he would be part of it. Hold you your peace. <clears throat> Skip down to verse 15, and we're going to backtrack in a little while, but all the way down to 2 Kings chapter 2, 15. <clears throat> And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, this is after Elijah, Elijah was taken up, Elisha comes back and parts the water now. Elisha smites the water of Jordan in the And when the sons of the prophets that were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. Now they knew it. Now they knew it. They didn't know it before. They knew Elijah was going to be taken, but Elisha knew something they didn't know. And he said that even now the prophets realized the spirit of Elijah took the rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, bowed themselves to the ground before him. Elijah knew this. He knew it was coming. So all along the way he's telling these other prophets, hold you your peace. Hold you your peace. Read verses 9 and 10 with me. So we're kind of backtracking. And it came to pass when they were going over, Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan River, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit, it's really the Lord's spirit, be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing or a difficult thing, nevertheless. If thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So there was a condition, right? There was a, a condition that the man had to be. If you see me when I'm taken, you will get what you've asked from the Lord. The Spirit of God has been on me. You've asked a hard thing. You want a double portion of that Spirit to be upon you. And he says, you're going to get that if you see me when I'm taken. So Elisha asked something. Good thing, like Solomon, right? Just been reading in my Bible about Solomon. Solomon could have asked anything he wanted from the Lord. And the Bible says that he, he asked for wisdom to know how to judge the people rightly. I'm like just a child, he said. I need wisdom to judge this great people. And the Lord says, I'm so glad you've asked that, Solomon. You asked to, for the wisdom to rightly judge my people that I made you king over. And so he says, I'm going to give you that, what you've asked, and I'm going to give you all these other things you didn't ask for. And so the fact that Elisha is asking for this and not for wealth or something like that, and he says, I'm going to pray for a double portion of the spirit that's on you, Elijah. 
And so he believed that it would be given him, that it would come, and that it would come to him through this man, and it would come to him at this moment. Okay, just keep that in mind. It was very, very significant, this day, and what it led up to in this moment, in this time, and him actually seeing Elijah when he's taken out. So he was fixed. Elisha, Elisha was unwavering. He was single-minded. It's a good trait. It's a good trait. The world looks at being narrow-minded and, and certain things until so you're narrow-minded as a bad thing. When it comes to the things of the Lord, we are to be very narrow-minded. In fact, we're so narrow-minded that we're single-minded. There's not a bunch of options and choices. If we read it here, and this is for my life, then I believe it and I'll walk in it. And it's not, the world can say what they will. The world, that they're going to die and go to hell if they don't give their lives to Christ. I want to walk with the Lord. And so this man, Elisha, was single-minded, and he was not distracted. These 50 prophets, I think it's in, in significant in verse 7, and the 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. I think there's something about that, too. This is not a criticism so much of the prophets, but these 50 men, they knew that Elijah was going to be taken. Elisha's right there with him, though. They're not going to be separated. They crossed the Jordan River together. The others didn't. They stood up to a view from afar off to see what was going to take place. But what's the significance of that? To me, I think it's, it's very significant. They stood to view afar off. Uh, they, they weren't part of what was going on. I'm not saying they weren't men of God. Okay? They were sons of the prophets. They knew what most of the world didn't know. That Elijah was going to be taken that day. They knew it. But they weren't part of what was going on. They were viewing from afar off. They were like spectators. I think a lot of the church world is like spectators. They might really be saved, but then they're pretty content in the world. And they, their, their heart's not burning for revival. Their heart's not burning for the return of the Lord. Their heart's not burning for a closer walk with the Lord. They're, they're viewing from afar off. Hey, I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder when it might happen. Interesting to think about things like that. And yet these, these prophets, uh, they, they stood to view afar off. Elisha wasn't viewing from afar off. He was in the midst of it. He was part of what was going on. He was part of what God was doing. He was going to be the recipient of this major blessing from the Lord that day. For the 50 prophets, I, I just consider them in this sense spectators. Again, I'm not saying they weren't godly. It's not a criticism so much of the sons of the prophets. To me, rather, it's a spiritual lesson to urge us on. I would rather be like Elijah, and I would rather be like Elisha than the 50 prophets who are watching from a distance, just to, almost as a spectator. I wonder what it's going to be like. It's going to be exciting. I wonder if we'll be able to catch a glimpse. Elisha caught more than a glimpse. Amen? He was there. He saw him. He talked to him when he was going up, which we're going to read in a moment. But they, they weren't part of what was going on. And <clears throat> they weren't serving the Lord Jesus Christ like Elisha was, or Elijah was. And I, I know we got a specific calling on Elijah's life and a specific calling on Elisha's life. That's not really my point. The point is that the fact that they stood afar off to watch as opposed to these other two men that were right in the heart and the center of what was going on. What do we know about Elijah? Elijah, we know that he stood in the presence of Almighty God continually. The Bible tells that in 1 Kings King 17 and 18, he stood in the presence of the Lord continually. So like Elisha was his servant and stood at his waiting for his beckoning call, whatever it may be, Elijah stood like that before Almighty God, before Jehovah. Elijah had been used to, to pray, to confront the wicked king Ahab, who was given over to Baal worship and killing the two priests and prophets of God in the land, it's rearing up altars to Baal throughout the land, and a temple to Baal, along with his wife Jezebel, who's wicked. Elijah confronted him, just one man confronting a king. Elijah said, it's not going to rain until I say so at the word of the Lord. And he prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Elijah called down fire from heaven. Just him, just one man, 
and the whole nation, and all the prophets of Baal and the groves, 850 in total. And just him, but he's got God behind him, amen? Behind him. And he calls down. Now, he's getting ready to go. His mission is finished on the earth. And what a mission he had. And God's still going to have his man. So it, these prophets were not part of what was going on. Elisha was part of it. Elisha was part of what was happening. It's a wonderful scripture. I know you know it, and I've shared it before, and you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 25, 14 says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show him his covenant. The next verse goes on to say, my eyes are ever upon the Lord. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show him his covenant. That word secret means intimate fellowship. The intimate fellowship of the Lord is with those that fear him. It's not with everybody. It's certainly not with the lost person who loves them. And it's not with every saved person to the degree it could be that intimate fellowship. The Lord saying, hey, Elijah, come here. I'm about to do something. You know, come over here and talk to you. I, I want to turn the hearts of the people of Israel and Samaria back to me. They've been worshiping Baal and Groves. He's a wicked king and a wicked queen. I'm going to turn their hearts back to me. I'm going to use you to do that, Elijah. The Lord, Elijah is standing in his presence. He knows the voice of the Lord. He has the same burden, the same heart. He's praying every day, oh God, turn the hearts of the people back to you. And the Lord says, I'm going to do that. Just sit tight, stay with me. And, and that's the secret. The secret of the Lord is within them that fear him. And he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever upon the Lord, the psalmist says. So let's keep reading. Second Kings, skip down to verse, we'll read 11 through 15. We're kind of all over the place. By the time we're through, we'll have completed this story. It came to pass as they still walked on. They crossed the shore by this time and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. And part of them both asunder. So once taken, Elijah's taken, they're split. They hadn't been split up until this moment. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in pieces. His master was taken from his head that day. He's going to get something in return. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from, from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he smote or struck, struck the waters of the Jordan River and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he, had, when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over and, and when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. What's the point of all this? There's a couple of points for us today, other than just a good, you know, biographical study of these two men. Here's the point for us. First of all, a person may be saved, and I'm likening them to the sons of the prophets. Again, it's not a criticism so much, okay, of the sons of the prophets. A, a man may be saved in our day, a Christian truly born again, and yet not be part of all that God is wanting to do in their lives and through their lives. They might be spectators. They might be Christian spectators. They might be churchgoers. They like church, they love the Lord, they come and go as they please. If something more interesting comes along for that Sunday, they go do that. They come in and out, in and out. They really are saved when they die, they go to heaven. They've trusted the Lord. And, and so a person can be saved, and I would liken them to these prophets, and yet not be, yet not be in that intimate fellowship with the Lord, not be used by God to the degree that he desires to use them. Not know and be known of him to the degree that the Lord desires to know and be known of those that he's redeemed. People can come this far and then stop. 
And some people go all the way. You know what I mean? Some people come this far and stop and they're content. And some go all the way. And the Lord is looking at it. He's it not a respecter of person. It's not just for Elijah and Elisha. Every one of us can go all the way, can go deeper. So that's the first point. <clears throat> second, second of all, is that a man or woman called like Elisha in our story, the man called by God, commissioned by the Lord, that God is desiring to use, uh, cannot be distracted by the other influences and voices around him. He could have, Elisha could have missed that blessing. He had got out of a call. And I've never counted him up. Maybe you have. But it, the biblical historians write, you know, when you pray for a double portion of the spirit that rested upon Elijah for himself, the, the Bible records that Elisha did exactly twice as many miracles as Elijah did. I just think it's interesting, okay? Just think it's interesting. He received from the Lord what he desired to receive. So my second point is that a man or woman that's called, like Elisha, knows that they're called. You cannot be distracted or deterred or hindered by other influences around you. He could have been hindered, first of all, by the man of God, Elijah. Remember, it's a test. That's not being mean, but it was a test. Elijah said, wait here. He tells him to wait in Gilgal. He tells him to wait in Bethel. He tells him to wait in Jericho. And he tells him three times to wait. And he says, no, I'm going to go on. And Elijah was content to let him go on. And he tested him again. And he tested him again. If God has called you, you know he's called you to whatever it is, you cannot be distracted or hindered by any other influence. These 50 prophets in two different places, okay, and in Bethel and Jericho, they said, don't you know the Lord's going to take your master away from you today? I know it. Hold your peace. Did that, did that influence him at all? It influenced him zero. Zero. I know what you're saying. I know what you know, and I know more than you know. He wasn't being smart at it. He's just saying, yea, I know it. Be silent. There's something coming my way. There's something bigger than you know of. There's something that I have to be a part of, and I need to be with this man when he's taken. I know it. Hold to your peace. You cannot be, the man or woman of God cannot be distracted. You, you and I need to walk in a singleness of purpose and singleness of mind and singleness of heart, and we need to ignore and put away every distraction, every opinion, even if it comes within the church house, and go on with God. See it through. Walk it out. Elisha had to see it through and walk it out. Had he stopped at any point along there, he would not have received the double portion of the Holy Spirit that had been upon Elijah, nor been used to the great way that God did use him. Historically, we know of it. <clears throat> we have to, sometimes, and I, I think... Sometimes, the longer I walk with the Lord, there are hindrances to what you have from the Lord and you want to walk it out. Certainly, the devil hinders us, right? He's our adversary. That means opposed to, he's our opponent, okay? And so the adversary, the devil is against us at every turn. This lost world out there that doesn't know the Lord with the spirit of any Christ is going to be opposed at us every time we try to make progress with Christ or do something he's called us to do. But sometimes, and I think many times, the deterrent or the hindrance comes through the naysayers, the skeptics, sometimes comes through Christian people. They just don't know. They're not mature. They're not prayed up. They're not walking closely with the Lord, possibly. They don't know what you know. You know, we all have the same Bible. We all know the same facts and so so forth. But there are those that press in to know the Lord more. And they're going to hear from the Lord more. And they're going to be called to do things from God more than maybe their neighbor sitting next to them. It doesn't have to be, but that's just the way it is. I know I've shared this before, but me and I, we hadn't been married for long, just probably six months, and the Lord called us into full-time ministry. I was I had a job and I was going to quit my job and, and start and then she was going to quit a few months later, which we did. We now 
obviously to our church at the time, asking for their prayer and, and just prayer for us as we undertook this new. We didn't have any children at the time. And I remember very clearly of his name. I know it very well. Wonderful Christian brother. Loves the Lord. He's a Christian. He came to me after and said, Randy, you can't do that. You can't do you can't quit your job. You can't have your wife quit her job. How are y'all gonna make it? How are you gonna live? What is that? What, that was a test for us day one. You know what I said to him? Thank you, Joe. I appreciate your concern, but we know the Lord's called us to this. Yeah, I know it. Hold you your peace. You know what I'm saying? I know it. I know it. God's, God's got it. You know the same God I know, but I, we have a calling, and we're going to walk in it. And we're trusting the Lord's going to take care of us. And so, think about it. Uh, Jesus had 12 disciples, didn't he? We know one betrayed him. He had 12 disciples, but even among those 12, when we talked about it, there were three that were closer. Does Jesus love them more? No, I don't think he loved them anymore. I think they loved him more. Even among these 12 that he chose, and the whole earth, he chose these 12 men, one betrayed him, so he got 11, and he, out of those 11, there were three, Peter, James, and John, that we see when he's going to raise Jairus' daughter, uh, when he goes over the Mount of Transfiguration, he takes these with him. When he's the garden of Gethsemane, he brings these a little further, and he himself goes a little further and prays. And even out of those three, there's one, John, the beloved, the disciple whom the Lord loved, who would not leave the Lord. He just would not be separated from him. Had his head on his, laying on his shoulder at the, at the Last Supper, uh, when all the others fled, and when Jesus was arrested, he, he, he fled and came back and followed from a distance and was right there. He's the one that Jesus on the cross said, take care of my mother. Was, was he special? Did the Lord just love him a little bit more? I don't think so. I think he loved the Lord a little bit more. The, the Lord was more valuable to him than anything else. And these other, I couldn't compare myself to Peter or James or any of these men that loved the Lord and died for the Lord. Do you understand the point though? And so the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The Lord's called us on. He's made us kings and priests unto our God. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 1. Of him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto our God. Am I a king and priest unto the Lord? I need to, to live that way. Sometimes the greatest deterrent or attempts at discouraging you from what God's called you to can come from other believers. And so we need to be able to Hear it and then put it away. Hear it and not be distracted by it, not be hindered by it. Here's the thing with some that are born again. They know some truth, but they don't know all of it about your circumstance, about your situation. They know some truth. They see part of the plan, part of the picture. They don't see what you see because you've been shut in with God. You've heard from the Lord. Elisha had been shut in with God and with his man Elijah for years. He heard from God. Okay, and these sons of the prophets were godly men. They knew part of the picture. They knew Elijah was going to be taken this day, but that's as far as they could go. He knew more. Elisha knew more. Yeah, I know it. Hold you your peace. I would say to you this morning, the Lord would say to us, Hear from the Lord. You hear from the Lord, and you refuse to be moved from that. Number one, hear from God yourself. Another man can't hear from God for you. Can up to a degree, okay? You hear from God yourself and then refuse to be moved from what he has spoken to you. Be confident in the call of God upon your life. It's not an arrogance, it's a knowing. <coughs> not an arrogance, it's a knowing. I don't detect anything arrogant about Elisha. 
when he's saying to other godly men and said, I know that will hold you your peace. Keep silent. Refuse to be moved even slightly from what the Lord has spoken. Elisha would be, would receive a double portion of the Spirit. And he would be that prophet in the stead or in the place of Elijah. He would be. It was coming to pass. God brought it to pass. And our Lord, we have a few scriptures I want to read, but the Lord Jesus Christ all through his life, his earthly life, was the perfect example. Perfect example of not being moved by the opinions of people, whether they were his followers or whether they were his haters. He was not moved, not one inch, not one second, from the plan, the cross. From going across the cross and out of the sin of the world. Nothing moved him. Again, remember that there was one point he was popular. The multitudes were following him in crowds and he's healed everybody and they want to take him and make him king. Nope. He passed the threat. I'm going to be king this time. I'm coming the second time to be a king. This time I'm giving the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Other times they want to stone him. Other times they want to throw him off a cliff. He just passed through. He was not deterred. I wanted to read this passage. I'm reading from Matthew 15. I'm going to read it for time's sake. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Now listen, listen who's telling his disciples, his followers. They left all to follow Jesus. The disciples came unto him after one encounter with the Pharisees and said, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Whatever Jesus had preached to them, don't you know, Jesus, you offended them. You offended the Pharisees. You know what I picture Jesus saying? Yeah, I know it. Hold you your peace. He answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father had not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. He's saying, I know it. I know it. They got hard hearts. They, they honor me with their lips and mouths, but their hearts far from me. I know it. I said what I'm supposed to say. Basically, I, I hear him saying to his disciples, I know it. I know they were offended. You think that's supposed to change my course? Is that supposed to change my mission? Is that supposed to change my message and my preaching? Because the Pharisees were offended not once, not one word. He loved the Pharisees and he loved all the people around him. He stayed the course. Yes, the Pharisees were offended. He's saying, hold your peace. I know they were. He said, I got a higher calling. I have a higher purpose and a higher mission. And I can't be distracted or, or influenced to change my course. I can't be slowed down. I can't change my preaching because the Pharisees were offended. They're unbelievers. He says, I have a purpose, and he's going to follow it out. That's what I gather from it. I have a cause and a course to finish that must be finished. I'll read another one. Jesus said in John 11, this is after Lazarus had died, and Jesus was not with Lazarus at the time. Then after that, he saith to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou there again? Don't you know, last time you were in Jerusalem, they wanted to kill you? And you want to go back there again? What's the thought? Yes, I know it. I know it. Hold you your peace. Okay? Hold you your peace. Jesus answered and said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. The point is, don't be distracted, y'all. When you know you've heard from God, you got to hear from God, first of all. This sermon isn't really on that. I'm assuming that you're praying and seeking God. There'll be another message on that, and seeking the Lord and hearing the voice of the Lord. Once you've heard, you need to walk in it and sort of lie. There are going to be naysayers. Not the naysayers of the world, the naysayers in the church. Naysayers, a lot of times, that are sitting right next to us. Bible says it when, well, let's turn and read it real quickly. Acts chapter 21. So here's Paul. 
He's heading back to Jerusalem for the last, last time after his third missionary trip. He's in Caesarea. Let's read Acts 21, 10 through 14. And as we tarried, Luke writes, there, there many days there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. He was a real prophet. He would have been like the sons of these prophets. He was a genuine prophet of God. Okay? So this prophet comes down. And when he was coming to, to us, he took Paul's girdle, that would have been the belt, which goes around the midsection. He took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem find the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, this would have been Luke too. Luke hears it and he says, Oh, Paul, you can't go. You can't go to Jerusalem. Don't do it. Don't do it. Both we and they that of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and break my heart? For I'm ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when we he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, The will of the Lord be done. You know what he's saying? Agabus, he wasn't being smart, Arlen. Agabus gave a true prophecy. That didn't happen to Paul. He was bound. Okay? The point is not a discredit at all to Agabus. The point was, I know it. Hold you your peace. This is what God's called me to do. I can't be distracted by good brothers pleading and weeping that I don't go there. This is what I'm called to do. So he's not being rude or unchristian or arrogant. We see it throughout the Bible. Uh, I'm going to give some examples in closing. Because I want to try to make it real to my life and to your life. You preached against the Muslims from that from your pulpit. You know that they might hear that. Those messages are put out online. They might burn your church down. Cornerstone, this church. You preached against Islam and that it's not, it's a false religion. Don't you know that you might, they might burn your church down? You might be up here praying one day and they come in, I'm always by myself, besides the Lord, come in here and chop your head off. Yeah, I know it, hold you your peace. Don't you know that people don't believe that Bible message any, anymore, it's outdated? Don't you know that churches don't have, most churches don't have Sunday night services anymore? Why do you still have them? You know what I say? I know it. Hold your peace. We have to do what God's called us to do. We have to walk in what the Lord's called us to do and not be distracted. You know, a lot of, I'm, I'm being the naysayer and then I'm answering it. You know, a lot of churches and believe pastors and they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit anymore. They believe that that's something that's done away with. I know it. A lot of people don't. I believe it. Hold you your peace. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to live it. I've experienced it. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of people don't believe it. You know the Reformed crowd, that, that Calvinist crowd was offended by your message? Don't you know the Bethel crowd is offended when you talk about Bill Johnson and that, that spirit that's not of God to their music? Yes, I know it. I know it. Hold you your peace. Don't you know the social drinking crowd in the church is offended when you talk about not drinking alcohol? I know it. Homosexual crowd is offended when you preach from Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality being an abomination and a sin against the Lord. Yeah, I know it. I know they're offended. You know the progressive church crowd is offended when you preach that against that, uh, their beliefs. Yes, I know it. You know Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. I know it. Hold to your peace. We could go on and on. You know our schools are run by godless people that are godless. 
I have an agenda. I have a rainbow flag in every classroom. I know it. Hold your peace. You know there are worldwide mandates and there's coming an economic collapse and there are uh, people that reject Christ and ridicule his followers and reject his word and the truth. You know they're trying to take away the church's tax exempt status when you give money that it won't be tax deductible anymore. Then what will the churches do? Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. You know, they're censoring people online and social media when they preach things like what's preached here and other places. You know, you've got to come up with something a lot more exciting to attract and keep the youth at your church today. A lot more exciting than what God do. Bible studies. You need a gym. You have stuff falling from the ceiling and games and jumping through whatever fire coming out to keep the youth. I know that's what you're saying. Hold your peace. We're doing what God's called us to do. You know what I say about the youth or any other age? They're going to be saved by the same gospel and they're going to be kept by the same Holy Ghost. You know that there are wicked men empowered in high places in this world like never before. They're in the highest positions and they determine evil against the righteous. Do you know that? Do y'all know it? There are wicked people in the highest places. Now there's one above them, hallelujah. Almighty God. They determine evil against the righteous. They're going to arrest you, maybe, or force you to take this, or censor you, or shut you down if you don't conform and don't comply. The world economy is about to crash. What are you going to do when you don't, your money's worthless? You know what I say? Yea, I know it. Hold you your peace. I'm not stupid. I'm not ignorant. I don't have stuck my head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend like it's not there. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm aware of these things. I don't belittle them. I don't uh, excuse them, ignore them. But I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. You and I are tell, you know, you know when I say, yes, I know that. Did you hear this? This is about to take place in it. You in it, or whatever it may be. And, and again, I'm not ridiculing these things. They're, they're true and they're real. I know that. The scripture already tells me that, that that's going to happen. I already know it from the word of God. Hold your peace. You don't know anything that we don't already know as children of the Lord and from his word and by his spirit within us. These things have been revealed to us and we're to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are to shine his light, Daniel said, in light of all the end times things that are coming. I study end times. Okay, and I understand it. I'm sure there are people that understand it more. We teach it, preach it. And they that are wise shall shine as the bright, brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You know what else we know that the, the, the world around us, and I'm saying the, the casual carnal church doesn't know? We know what they know and a lot more. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We know that he's coming again and every eye is going to see him. We know that he's going to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. We know, and we could go on and on and on, that my God shall supply all your need. What about when the economy collapses? Do I think it should be wise? And yes, absolutely. How much is enough? Do you have two weeks worth of cash? Two months worth of cash? Two years worth of cash? What if you don't have that? But if you're living day to day, if it's too bad for you, I guess you're done. How much is enough? Do I think we should be wise and have some preparations? Absolutely. To what degree? You know, the wisest thing you can do, press in close to the Lord. Hear from Him. Elijah knew when it was time to 
he's go to the brook Kidron, uh, Cherith, and, and go to the hide with the widow woman and be sustained. And when it was time to confront the king, he knew exactly when and where and what to be said and what to do. Not be little in these things. They're scary. They're real. All these things that are going on. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to close with this. Don't be distracted from your heavenly calling either by the devil or a lost world or from Christians that don't know what you know from the Lord. Don't be distracted. Preach this gospel to all men. I do know I'm supposed to do that. Lift up the name of kids above every name. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Gather with the saints of God and all the more as you see the day approaching. These things I know. I'm confident. Stay right there in that. Worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Love your brothers in Christ and your neighbors yourself. These are things, yeah, I know it. Hold, hold your peace. I understand it. Now, don't you know you're crazy? The, uh, you're crazy to build an ark? What are you doing? Noah. It, it never rained on the earth. You're building a boat on the side of a mountain. Don't you know you're crazy, Noah? He's the only sane one on the planet. The only sane one. Noah, you have I seen righteous in this generation. Just Noah. <coughs> Don't you know you're crazy? A lot of the church world at that time would say you're crazy, Noah. Yeah, Noah, hold you your peace. Never rained on the earth. I know that. I know what you know, and I know a whole lot more than you know, too. Walk with God. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies, and they loved not their lives, even unto the death. Y'all stand with me this morning. I wish we had our whole church here. We're a lot are out today. Glad that you're here. These altars are open. Hear from God and then stay in what He's called you to do. Elisha did receive that blessing. He was used by the Lord. He had that walk with God. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth where it dwelleth righteousness. Can we know something they don't know? Wherefore, beloved, seeing you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord. You for real to us by your word the times in which we live. We're not to be ignorant of the spiritual times and the spiritual climate in our world, in our country. The wickedness that's in positions and high positions and authority, mandates and, and so many things that are going on. We understand a lot of truth to a lot of those things. But God, we have greater truth. We know it. God, help us to stay the course of what you've called us to do, to let not our hearts be troubled. To be the boldest witness we've ever been in this day and in this hour. God, I pray you bless your people. I pray you give us courage. I pray you give us clear direction in our own hearts and lives. I pray we would not be distracted or discouraged or hindered by the influence and opinions of others, whether they're in the church or out of the church. The secret of the Lord is within them here now. God, help us to walk in that singleness of heart, in that intimate fellowship with you, Lord. Make us wise in this time. Those that name I'm talking about that turn me into righteousness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.